Tao in its transcendental aspect and in its physical manifestation by Lao Tzu, translated from the Chinese by Lionel Giles. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Tao which can be expressed in words is not the eternal Tao. The name which can be uttered is not its eternal name. Without a name, it is the beginning of heaven and earth. With a name, it is the mother of all things. Only one who is ever free from desire can apprehend its spiritual essence. He who is ever a slave to desire can see no more than its outer fringe. These two things, the spiritual and the material, though we call them by different names, and their origin are one and the same. This sameness is a mystery, the mystery of mysteries. It is the gate of all wonders. How unfathomable is Tao! It seems to be the ancestral progenitor of all things. How pure and clear is Tao! It would seem to be everlasting. I know not of whom it is the offspring. It appears to have been anterior to any sovereign power. Tao eludes the sense of sight and is therefore called colorless. It eludes the sense of hearing and is therefore called soundless. It eludes the sense of touch and is therefore called incorporeal. These three qualities cannot be apprehended, and hence they may be blended into unity. Its upper part is not bright, and its lower part is not obscure. Ceaseless in action, it cannot be named but returns again to nothingness. We may call it the form of the formless, the image of the imageless, the fleeting and the indeterminable. Would you go before it, you cannot see its face. Would you go behind it, you cannot see its back. The mightiest manifestations of active force flow solely from Tao. Tao in itself is vague, impalpable. How impalpable, how vague. Yet, Within it, there is form. How vague, how impalpable. Yet within it, there is substance. How profound, how obscure. Yet within it, there is a vital principle. This principle is the quintessence of reality, and out of it comes truth. From of old until now, its name has never passed away. It watches over the beginning of all things. How do I know this about the beginning of things? Through Tao. There is something, chaotic yet complete, which existed before heaven and earth. Oh, how still it is and formless, standing alone without changing, reaching everywhere without suffering harm. It must be regarded as the mother of the universe. Its name I know not. To designate it, I call it Tao. Endeavoring to describe it, I call it great. Being great, it passes on. Passing on, it becomes remote. Having become remote, it returns. Therefore, Tao is great. Heaven is great. Earth is great. And the sovereign also is great. In the universe, there are four powers of which the sovereign is one. Man takes his law from the earth. The earth takes its law from heaven. Heaven takes its law from Tao, but the law of Tao is its own spontaneity. Tao in its unchanging aspect has no name. Small though it be in its primordial simplicity, mankind dare not claim its service. Could princes and kings hold and keep it, all creation would spontaneously pay homage. Heaven and earth would unite in sending down sweet dew, and the people would be righteous unbidden and of their own accord. As soon as Tao creates order, it becomes nameable. When it once has a name, men will know how to rest in it. Knowing how to rest in it, they will run no risk of harm. Tao, as it exists in the world, is like the great rivers and seas which receive the streams from the valleys. All pervading is the great Tao. It can be at once on the right hand and on the left. All things depend on it for life and it rejects them not. Its task accomplished, it takes no credit. 
it loves and nourishes all things but does not act as master it is ever free from desire we may call it small all things return to it yet it does not act as master we may call it great the whole world will flock to him who holds the mighty form of tao they will come and receive no hurt but find rest peace and tranquillity with music and dainties we may detain the passing guest but if we open our mouths to speak of tao he finds it tasteless and insipid not visible to the sight not audible to the ear in its use it is inexhaustible retrogression is the movement of tao weakness is the character of tao all things under heaven are products of being but being itself is the product of not being tao is a great square with no angles a great vessel which takes long to complete a great sound which cannot be heard a great image with no form tao lies hid and cannot be named yet it has the power of transmuting and perfecting all things tao produced unity unity produced duality duality produced trinity and trinity produced all existing objects these myriad objects leave darkness behind them and embrace the light being harmonized by contact with the vital force tao produces all things its virtue nourishes them each is formed according to its nature each is perfected according to its strength hence there is not a single thing but pays homage to tao and extols its virtue this homage paid to tao this extolling of its virtue is due to no command but is always spontaneous thus it is that tao engendering all things nourishes them develops them and fosters them perfects them ripens them tends them and protects them production without possession action without self-assertion development without domination this is its mysterious operation the world has a first cause which may be regarded as the mother of the world when one has found the mother one can know the child knowing the child and still keeping the mother to the end of his days he shall suffer no harm it is the way of heaven not to strive and yet it knows how to overcome not to speak and yet it knows how to obtain a response it calls not and things come of themselves it is slow to move but excellent in its designs heaven's net is vast though its meshes are wide it lets nothing slip through the way of heaven is like the drawing of a bow it brings down what is high and raises what is low it is the way of heaven to take from those who have too much and give to those who have too little but the way of man is not so he takes away from those who have too little to add to his own superabundance what man is there that can take of his own superabundance and give it to mankind only he who possesses tao the tao of heaven has no favorites it gives to all good men without distinction things wax strong and then decay this is the contrary of tao what is contrary to tao soon perishes end of tao in its transcendental aspect and in its physical manifestation by lao tzu translated from the chinese by lionel giles read by nemo unman not thyself by sir thomas brown sixteen hundred and five to sixteen hundred and eighty two from christian morals this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org live unto the dignity of thy nature and leave it not disputable at last whether thou hast been a man or since thou art a composition of man and beast how thou hast predominantly passed thy days to state the denomination unman not therefore thyself by a bestial transformation nor realize old fables expose not thyself by four-footed manners unto monstrous draughts 
and caricature representations think not after the old pythagorean conceit what beast thou mayest be after death be not under any brutal metempsychosis while you livest and walkest about erectly under the scheme of man in thine own circumference as in that of the earth let the rational horizon be larger than the sensible and the circle of reason than of sense let the divine part be upward and the region of beast below otherwise tis but to live invertedly and wish thy head unto the heels of thy antipodes desert not thy title to a divine particle and union with invisibles let true knowledge and virtue tell the lower world thou art a part of the higher let thy thoughts be of things which have not entered into the hearts of beasts think of things long past and long to come acquaint thyself with the corrigium of the stars and consider the vast expansion beyond them let intellectual tubes give thee a glance of things which visible organs reach not have a glimpse of incomprehensibles and thoughts of things which thoughts but tenderly touch lodge immaterials in thy head ascend unto invisibles fill thy spirit with spirituals with the mysteries of faith the magnality of religion and thy life with the honour of god without which though giants in wealth and dignity we are but dwarfs and pygmies in humanity and may hold a pitiful rank in that triple division of mankind into heroes men and beasts for though human souls are said to be equal yet is there no small inequality in their operations some maintain the allowable station of men many are far below it and some have been so divine as to approach the apogeum of their natures and to be in the confinium of spirits behold thyself by inward optics and the crystalline of thy soul strange it is that in the most perfect sense there should be so many fallacies that we are fain to make a doctrine and often to see by art but the greatest imperfection is in our inward sight that is to be ghosts unto our own eyes and while we are so sharp-eyed as to look through others to be invisible unto ourselves for the inward eyes are more fallacious than the outward the vices we scoff at in others laugh at us in ourselves avarice pride falsehood lie undiscerned and blindly in us even to the age of blindness and therefore to see ourselves interiorly we are fain to borrow other men's eyes wherein true friends are good informers and censurers no bad friends conscience only that can see without light sits in the areopagi and dark tribunal of our hearts surveying our thoughts and condemning our obliquities happy is that state of vision that can see without light though all should look as before the creation when there was not an eye to see or light to actuate a vision wherein notwithstanding obscurity is only imaginable respectively unto eyes for unto god there was none eternal light was ever created light was for the creation not himself and as he saw before the sun may still also see without it in the city of the new jerusalem there is neither sun nor moon where glorified eyes must see by the archetypal sun or the light of god able to illuminate intellectual eyes and make unknown visions intuitive perceptions in spiritual beings may perhaps hold some analogy unto vision but yet how they see us or one another what eye 
what light or what perception is required unto their intuition is yet dark unto our apprehension and even how they see god or how unto our glorified eyes the beatific vision will be celebrated another world must tell us when perceptions will be new and we may hope to behold invisibles end of on man not thyself by sir thomas brown sixteen hundred and five to sixteen hundred and eighty two from christian morals